Hello, and welcome to my channel. In this video, I am going to be telling you why I think you should read the Crown of Stars series by Kate Elliott. Now, as in all of my Why You Should Read videos, I also like to always make sure that I am doing my best to mention some things that people may see as negatives or just things that I find negative in a series in general. Uh, and just kind of generally, uh, I call it a Why You Should Read because, you know, that's what people call them. But more so, this is uh, more of a video to try to sell you on a series that I love, but also let you know if it's going to be something that you will enjoy. Uh, most of these series I've done these for uh, have been a bit divisive, whereas there's definitely people who do not care uh, for the series as much as I do, uh, because for some reason I've mostly done this for slow burn fantasy, which is not uh, everyone's favorite thing. Uh, but So I will be doing my best to try to talk about both sides there and make sure to point things out so that I'm not just telling you, this is amazing, go get it, and you read it and you're like, oh, this isn't what I thought at all, and I don't like this style of thing. Uh, even though it's something I love, of course, not everyone will. But let's talk about Crown of Stars. So Crown of Stars is a sprawling epic fantasy series. It consists of seven books, and it takes place in basically an alternate version of Europe, as well as some other surrounding geographical locations. Uh, it's not immediately apparent when looking at the map because the, the map of this world is in some ways kind of like turned on its side. Uh, as you start to explore out more and see the, the bigger areas, you can see, oh yeah, that makes sense where this is. And this isn't one of those maps where it's like, oh look, it's Europe on its side. Like it is very specifically, a lot of elements of this uh, specifically do have parallels to actual locations uh, and history to an extent. Uh, to the fact that this series actually has, I've seen it referred to online sometimes as almost being historical fiction because of the fact that there are very clear and intentional parallels to actual history. Now, uh, I'll note right off the bat too, originally this was going to be two trilogies instead of a seven book series. Uh, things kind of changed as Kate Elliott was writing it. I have actually, I used to have book club versions and I got my full size hardcover collection uh, from Andrew. Uh, and so I was excited to get that, but they're all first editions, so they all have notes telling you that, like, I swear there's only going to be, like, this many more books, uh, but it turned out ended up being seven, and I've seen some people say that, like, oh, man, it's, you know, because of the fact that it, it wasn't originally going to be like this, it just drags out, or she's lost control of the story. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. I have seen reviews specifically say that. Uh, there's a lot of cohesion, and it's a very complex story. Uh, but so for me, that was nothing to worry about. Uh, it made me laugh knowing, of course, that I know how many books there are, but I'm reading uh, the, the series for the first time as if I didn't. Uh, but really, I, I think it worked out quite well. This has a kind of like early medieval type setting. Like I said, a lot of it does have historical parallels. Uh, the kind of the base small plot, and I'll explain why I say small plot, uh, to begin with is King Henry who is warring with his uh, rebellious sister, Sibella. Uh, and there's also an invasion by these kind of humanoid rock creatures uh, called Ica coming from the north as well. And so that's kind of the, the setting is this war going on here uh, between these areas. And Henry uh, is the king of both Wendar and Vari, which have been under one king for some time. Uh, the, the whole like political... Um, game with the lords and kings and genealogy is quite important. Each one of these books does start out showing a little genealogical uh, chart of the recent kings of Wendar and Vari, uh, both before they were combined and so on. And so that's kind of the, the base uh, plot of where we start. Our main characters we follow, although there are quite a lot of characters, still kind of the main two from the first book are Elaine, who is an orphan boy who was promised to the church uh, by the people who raised him, but then he has a run-in with the very mysterious Lady of Battles, who uh, he makes a deal to serve uh, in return for his village being spared while the Ica, which I talked about, are attacking. Uh, we also follow Leith, who is the daughter of a Mathematicus, which is uh, basically somebody who uses math, but there's some like sorceress uh, things that go along with it as well, uh, which I'll get into a little bit more when I talk about the magic system uh, and, and how all of that works. Uh, but so she is has been on the run basically her whole life with her father, 
uh, who fears for his life. And then after he's killed, uh, she's enslaved uh, by a churchman, a freighter. And then that's kind of where the story starts from there. So that's the start of our story. We've got this uh, political upheaval, a war between people claiming the right of the throne and the regna, uh, and then also the smaller stories of these two characters. But we have a much bigger story, uh, hence where the, the title Crown of Stars for the series comes from as well, where thousands of years ago, uh, a primitive people basically cast a huge spell that literally tore a race of people called the Aoi, or there's a few different names for them depending on who you ask, off of the earth into the ether, uh, and uh, there's now basically it's starting to come back, and uh, it's a huge plot point where there are definitely sorcerers who are trying to make sure they get kicked back out. There's people trying to stop it, so there's this huge, literally earth shadowing, earth shadowing, earth shattering uh, events that are also going on as well. Uh, and so that's kind of the build-up for the whole series, and we have a really nice mix, in my opinion, of looking at both the small and the large scale a lot with this. Uh, so th that's kind of the plot in general of what we're talking about. The next big thing I do want to talk about is uh, a little bit more about the, the plot uh, specifics, well, not specifics to the plot, but more details about uh, what I like about the plot, how the plot works, uh, and also the pacing, because this is a series where details are very important. And I think some of the people who uh, kind of felt like they didn't realize where the story was going on later uh, didn't pay enough attention to details because this is really a series where a lot of small things are vastly important. Uh, in the final book, there are quite a few things from the very first book, from very early on, some which seemed a bit inconsequential, that come back in a really big way. There's a lot, pretty much everything here is put very intentionally. Uh, there is a lot of foreshadowing, and sometimes it takes a while for it to come back. That's a thing that I see as a very big strength. I always love that, too, with, like, rereading Wheel of Time, where you catch these little hints, the foreshadowing, the things that come back. That's something that I really enjoy. But if you are looking for more of a casual read, Crown of Stars may not be for you. It is really something you have to pay attention to. The plot is very complex. There's a lot of interweaving plots and subplots, and it is a very slow-burn fantasy story. Once again, that's something that I enjoy, but I know that some people don't like complex, slower series, and that's totally okay, too. It's not everybody wants to spend a lot of time and read a slower story. A lot of my favorites happen to be slow burn, and so that's why I like to always mention that uh, when you have it with it. Now, something I'll mention that is a negative, and it it's something that actually really annoys me in stories, depending on the degree. You do get some repetitious language. Uh, the one that really gets me is everyone always telling everyone else to hush. This is worse than book three for some reason. Uh, and it just gave me flashbacks to Faithful in the Fallen, which I loved. But everybody was always going, huh. And I'm just like, find a new word. So you you will get some of that. Uh, and then just like I Lady, uh, some scriptures, things like that that are brought up quite a lot. You do get some of that. I feel like that's unavoidable to an extent. Uh, and a lot of it is just the way that people talk. Uh, but I know that's something that annoys people, me included. Uh, there are some series where it's bothered me more than others, uh, but granted, a lot of my favorites are definitely guilty of doing that as well, but it's something I figured I would mention up. Um, I, I mentioned that just a lot of the, the details, the small details, are relevant later, and the story kind of works that way with the plot as well, which is something that I really enjoyed also. We start out uh, on a pretty small scale, all things considered. Uh, it is war between the Regnant and his sister, so between different areas, uh, in our kind of smaller area, but every book we grow outwards. Uh, we get introduced to new lands, uh, new, you know, countries, peoples, races, uh, creatures, because uh, there are definitely, I've mentioned the Ica a couple of times, who are, uh, they're called the Rock Children, and uh, they're basically described as, they, they are humanoid, but like they have claws, and they have like bronze, rocky type bodies, uh, they're said to be basically created in a cataclysm uh, where they were the infusion of humans, the blood of dragons, and the earth, uh, which is a pretty cool detail, I think. And so they're definitely unique. You also have lots of creatures, both sentient and non-sentient. You've got a guivere. I don't know how to say that. It's G-U-I-V-R-E. Uh, guivere? I don't know. Um, it's one of those words that I've never had to pronounce out loud before, and I just read it, and my brain just makes up how it makes sense to read it. Uh, but it's kind of like a dragon or a wyvern uh, type thing. You know, we've got 
all kinds of other stuff in there from griffins to like sphinx all kinds of different creatures and just different magical things that are introduced uh which which i quite enjoy so it really each book really does feel like it builds more and more. We find more and more about what's going on. Sometimes it's finding out about the past. Sometimes it's more about the present or just uh, going to strange far off places that we haven't been. And the way it's all woven together, I think works super well. And then of course there's uh, the politics. And I've touched on this a little bit, but politics are super important, whether it's court intrigue, uh, different lords and ladies vying for the regnancy, uh, looking back at who's got the legal claim to this or that, the nature of regnancy of lords. There's a ton of that going on. There's a lot of people moving in these circles and there's different circles being created. So you definitely get a lot of like politics, intrigue, that sort of thing. But a huge part uh, about also the, the world that I get more into it is the, the religion. Religion plays a massive role in this series, which I'll talk about a little bit more when I talk about the world building and how it's built out. Uh, but kind of the, the base idea of the religion, it's very similar to uh, Christianity or Catholicism in a lot of ways uh, with kind of the, the general, basically, structure, I guess I should say. Like you have your monasteries, your temples, and um, that sort of thing. Uh, you have like, you know, freighter and abbot and brother and sister and this and that and the other thing. Uh, the really big difference, though, is the fact that in the religion, it's called the Circle of Unity. Uh, it's called that because they believe, I guess, our main characters. I'll get more into other religious stuff later. But our main characters, they believe in both a lord and a lady who are one. So it's both a male and female presence in God, which differs from usually the male God that you see in, you know, Christianity Catholicism, uh, and a lot of other religions. So it's the combination there. There is the Blessed Dyson, who was their son, who bodily ascended to the Chamber of Light, which is like heaven. So there are a lot of parallels there. It does go and get a lot more complicated, and there's a lot of differing viewpoints as well that are brought up. But religion is very much something that's at the forefront. It's very integral to the plot at points. Uh, and it's something that continues on also throughout, which, like I said, I'll get into a little bit more of that, but that's something I do want to, to, to mention with just kind of uh, plots in the book. The big next thing I want to talk about is world building, and I've talked about that a little bit, which is talking about how the, the plot and the pacing works, where we just build up and build up more. But I want to talk more specifically about how the world is built, because the first thing to know is this is an extremely realistic medieval setting. Uh, and Elliot mentions in the notes at the beginning that she did actually specifically study multiple uh, medieval texts and try to make sure things were accurate uh, and correct for how she was portraying things. And she pulled some inspiration from looking at these actual texts uh, talking about the medieval world. This is not one of those stories where it's medieval, but then like everything kind of works out like today at all. It is, I, I have to say, probably the most like medieval centric uh, and, and realistic and things that make sense that I've seen. Down to like, you know, the king and the progress going and wherever they go, you know, the people have to hold a feast for them, whether or not they have the food for it, you know, like servants or maybe fed scraps from the plates. You have all these people who are common, even if they're favored, even if they like work for the king in some relation, they still like, they get the leavings and it's all about the lords. The way that lords and nobles act uh, very much is is pretty realistic and fitting for they they see themselves as above the common people, the peasantry, and they're given that right by God and the way religion plays into all of that. So really interesting just to see how much that was done and to the extent that that was done. And that's a really big thing uh, you get. Also just the idea of, you know, there's no like quick communication for the most part. You've got lots of times where you also get normal things like the the first battle, the like the first big battle in the first book, there's a total of maybe like 800 people fighting that battle. And it's a huge battle. And usually a lot of times in books, even if it's a more medieval setting, they're like, they have an army of 10,000 that just showed up. Well, that's not really how it worked. Like, you know, you'd have to send out messengers to like levy troops, get your standing troops wherever you have, have troops stationed or garrison, and then pull in peasants, you know, and arm them. And so it's, you know, if you're having a fairly short notice battle, 
it's not going to be that many people. And that was something I immediately appreciated uh, is I saw that. And I, I remember seeing, after I finished the series and was reading some more uh, stuff that Kate Elliott talked about it, she actually specifically called that out too, where some people were like, that's dumb. Why are there only like 800 people? And it's because like, it made sense. You're not going to just have randomly uh, the king or any lord just be like, I have 10,000 people. And that's a really common thing you see that a lot of series get wrong. So I, I just really appreciated uh, the way that that was done. Um, so that's something that I, I really enjoyed. Uh, which is how realistic it is. And so the other thing to talk a little bit more about religion, like I said I was going to, is the way it works. And Kate Elliott said it in the, the note for the last book. She talked about with religion, she wanted to show how religion is a thing that's alive to the people that believe. And belief and differing uh, parts of the religion, views and heresies and just different religions entirely are things that are incredibly important to the story uh, and things that are discussed quite a lot. Uh, it's definitely one of those things, if you don't like a lot of religion in your books, this is not probably going to be a series that you enjoy because it is very, very present uh, and important to the plot. And there's quite a lot of discussion on it, but I found it to be pretty interesting. Also early on in the series, there were mentions specifically of how some people who weren't like near any, you know, population centers, they still worship their old gods. Like they, you know, publicly would say that they follow the circle of unity, but they didn't really convert. There's also specific mentions of like other countries that were brought under the control or like allied and, you know, outwardly say like, yeah, we follow your religion. Don't worry about it. And then just completely still practice their own and pretend to... And the way it was done with that, too, where it wasn't just this one religion, I found that to be really realistic, the way that it was done. Uh, and it's just interesting seeing the way that different things uh, arise, too. So it, it felt very real because parts of the story you see where there's the established religion, there are definitely other areas that have completely different viewpoints of it, which is uh, pretty realistic, too. There's literally been times where there were multiple, like, popes in the Catholic Church in history because of disagreements on certain things. Uh, and so it, it doesn't quite go to that point um, in general, but you get these different views and you see kind of like heresy growing like it's a thing alive and these different viewpoints and people being pulled in and kind of seeing this religious movement form. And it was really interesting and the, the way it was done is just not something you see quite a lot. Uh, I mentioned already, too, that you have the differences in religion because of the fact that both uh, a, a male and a female deity are one, essentially, and so that also plays a huge role in gender dynamics, especially in a medieval world, because in the world we have, um, you can have either a king or a queen, you know, lords and ladies, like, you know, whatever the title is, whether, you know, you're a duke or a count, it's like, it, it could be male or female, uh, specifically, only women can hold the highest roles of the church, um, specifically. So it's the, the Scopos, which is like the Pope, um, specifically, can only be a woman. And men can only rise so far in the church because women are deemed it to be holier, basically. Uh, there's also a lot of talk, too, with succession that um, where, you know, you'd look at it like typical medieval, like it's the man's line that's the most important. Uh, but here specifically, it's it's mentioned that a lot of people actually look at it as you can only really trust the woman's line because she's the one actually giving birth. So, like, you always know that it's it's her child, and so that's much more important than the man's line. And it's all of these things that are wildly different because of one change to the structure of the religion. Uh, so also something I found super interesting with the way that that worked and was explored uh, in general. So I mentioned also... Uh, with the expansion into other worlds. I think that's done really well in a gradual way. We're not trying to throw in everything immediately. We start pretty small. There are early on, especially some kind of info dump type things. A lot of it's when scripture is being read out loud. Once again, something that actually makes sense when they're like at a feast, like, oh, read us this story or this scripture. So it makes sense to see it that way. Um, but we do get some of that as info dumps early on. But it, the further you get, the less and less of that's necessary. Some of it's just setting up. So it is a gradual build into all of the large things. There are uh, some lands that you don't see until much later, uh, even though they're mentioned specifically. So it's not like things are thrown in later. There are a lot of things that are kind of set up so that they can come back later as well. And so just the, the way the world was done, it was a very complex world. Uh, we, we have uh, events that are important 
of course, that are current, but there's also things that happened thousands and thousands of years ago that are vitally important to the plot. Uh, and the way all of it was woven together, I just thought was masterful and was fantastic. So I should probably talk now that I've been talking way too long, probably already about characters. So let's talk uh, about the characters and I'll try to wrap it up here before too long. Uh, I did really enjoy the main characters. Elaine was my favorite. Um, it's Elaine reminded me of a character Robin Hobb would write, which is something that I really enjoy. Uh, and uh, you do get some of the other characters who tend to be a little bit annoying, uh, like Leoth and uh, Sam Glant uh, can be a bit annoying at some point, and some other characters. But something I did like is the just the cast of characters is very wide. And there are all kinds of different characters. We start uh, with an area where we're really looking at, you know, one group of people, but we expand a ton. So we're seeing all kinds of different peoples and cultures, but also people from all walks of life. You know, we will have POVs where we're looking at the king's progress and the nobles. We'll have uh, POVs where we're with common soldiers, where we're with peasants, common people, uh, people from different lands. There is just so much and so many different characters. And a lot of the side characters are really, really fantastic as well. You don't get, uh, like, just random characters that are thrown in for no reason either. If you're following a character, they're going to be important to some extent. Sometimes you do have to wait around to see the character you want to see again. So that's something I will note because I know that ticks people off. Um, that's something like infamously in, in Wheel of Time. Sometimes you have to wait forever to get to the character that you want to read about again. Uh, if you have your favorite character. So you will get that here a bit, I will warn you as well. Uh, this is definitely a series where there's a lot going on, and so you, you do check in with all the characters, but sometimes you don't hear from some for a while. Um, but Elaine, I just, <clears throat> as my favorite character, the, his whole plot line with what he's trying to do and just trying to do the right thing and it never seeming to work out for him, uh, I fantastic, and I, I can't get too much into any of his information without having spoilers, but I it's my favorite character out of the series. The other thing I want to talk about is the villains, because we have both actual villains, um, and then we have people who are, like, very villainous, uh, but really, really great at writing them, because there are definitely some characters you will hate, and then there are some characters who are technically on the, you know, good side, quote-unquote. It's not really good or evil either is the thing. Everybody has their own interests that they're fighting for, and you more so have just different factions, different groups of people all going toward different goals. Uh, but there are definitely characters that you will hate. Uh, other characters who maybe seem like good people but do bad things. And then you've got characters that are on, like I said, like the side of good that are terrible people. Uh, one of the worst characters is on, like, the quote-unquote good side. And he is a terrible, terrible person, but he's on that side. And so just the way you see some of those things happen, it, it's done in a, a really, really interesting way that just makes it a great, great read. So finally, let's get to the conclusion and uh, the kind of the who I recommend for. So hopefully after seeing me talk for this freaking long, uh, you have a good idea of whether or not this is something that you're interested in and want to try. But specifically... Uh, I would recommend Crown of Stars for fans of a few different series. So, the first one uh, may surprise you is a Song of Ice and Fire fans. I did not care for a Song of Ice and Fire, and it wasn't because of the story, it was because of George R.R. Martin's writing style. But, uh, as I made quite a lot of allusions to, this is a very medieval world, including a lot of gritty bits about that kind of world. There were a lot of things reading this that you would find in Martin's work as well. And so I, I specifically do think people who are a fan of that series, which is also known for being slow uh, and having a lot kind of going on and building and uh, it, meandering along sometimes as well as repetitious writing, which that's the series that the repetition annoyed me the most of all, just for the record. Uh, so I do think people who enjoy that uh, are more likely to enjoy this than maybe people who don't. Uh, which I can't say that for full certainty because I really don't like A Song of Ice and Fire and I loved this series, uh, but I think there are some parallels to be drawn. Unsurprisingly, uh, Wheel of Time is one I would mention. Wheel of Time is one of the most notorious series for the amount of world building and expanding out, going to 14 books. Uh, this is only seven, and they're most of them aren't as long either. Uh, but also, just because, like I said, this is a series that really builds and expands in a fantastic way. So if you like diving into a world and just having ever-increasing world-building, uh, which is something that you get in Wheel of Time, I think this is something that you may enjoy as well. 
Uh, and then specifically, I do want to mention also Robin Hobb's Realm of the Elderlings because of some of the way that just characters are written really reminded me of Hobb. Like I said, specifically Elaine uh, felt like a character Hobb would write with some of the things that happened to him. It's not just him, though. There's a lot of things that happen that I could definitely see being in a Hobb book. So uh, those are three author slash series that I think if you're a fan of those, uh, there's a good chance that you will be a fan of Crown of Stars. Um, so that's that's definitely kind of the, the, the groups I would recommend. And if all the things I described, if those are things uh, that you too enjoy, the things I said, uh, then I think this is going to be a good one for you. If you were turned off as soon as I mentioned, like, slow burn and really big world building or the religion or the politics, then maybe this isn't for you. But this is a series that I loved. This definitely goes in the old top ten list of my favorite series of all time. So I, I would absolutely love to hear from anybody who has read this series and get your thoughts, whether you agree with me or don't. Uh, also, I would love to hear if you end up reading this series. Please let me know, uh, either comments here or if it's later in the Discord, which you can, of course, find the link in the description for. Uh, the Wizardly Duo Discord. I absolutely love talking about Crown of Stars because I do not know many people who've read it. I know some people who are going to get ready to start it soon, which excites me a lot. I would love to talk to you about this series, so definitely let me know. Make sure to give the video a like if you enjoyed it, and of course, if you enjoy my content, make sure to subscribe. <laughs>